letting the boys understand why the foot is so important and why we make a big fuss about ankle stretches and splints and things. I mean, we know that fingers get tight and we know that hips get tight, but we don't splint them in the same way we splint feet. Oh, I'm going to take myself off volume. I've got some background noise. I'll just do a really quick intro tonight, Marion. <laughs> okay. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us. It's six of six that we have got others coming up in the pipeline, which we'll be releasing shortly. Um, again, welcome to you guys and to the people that are on Watch Again. Um, I'm really, really pleased to introduce and to welcome the lovely uh, lead physiotherapist at GOSH, Marion Main. Um, who is joining us tonight. We've got a bit of a different one tonight. It's going to be more Q&A, more open forum. I've got a, a couple of questions um, which have been sent through to me um, and also really happy to take questions from, um, from the attendees. Um, but Marion, I'm sure you'll be able to give us some more of your amazing insight into physiotherapy, physician. So over to you. Thank you so much. Okay, good evening. Lockdown is being unlocked. I'm not sure everybody's thrilled about that, but we are emerging. And what we know that we are seeing as lockdown unlocks is feet that are getting tighter and hips are getting tighter. And generally, even though we've been exercising, it's not a surprise that the children are not as active as they are in normal situation where we get up, we go to school, we have routines. And there are some parents as much as children who've really been working hard physically, but a lot of boys have deteriorated. And a lot of what I want to talk about tonight is the sort of thing that the boys complain about. Because when you go to your physiotherapist or when you go to your neuromuscular center, what we often fail to think about is when you leave, what is it that you wanted to leave with? What did you intend as parents, as children, to get out of the session, apart from out the door and run away as quickly as you can or wheel away as quickly as you can? What do you want from physiotherapy? And very often what you never ever get is some explanations of why. Why? do we do what we do? Why are physios such pains in the butt when it comes to feet and stretches? Why do they want you to wear splints? Why do they seem to make life more difficult? And why can we just not have physio because none of our friends or brothers and sisters do? So I'm going to start at the bottom and work up. And what I really want to do is talk about a couple of things that nobody ever explains. And the first one is what we call hypermobility. And although many of you have joints that get tight, some of you are quite bendy and you can have bendy feet and bendy joints, bendy knees, wobbly hips, which are nothing to do with Duchenne. And generally, those of you who are bendy, the boys, will probably have at least one parent who is also bendy. Now, and this is important, Bendiness is when your joints move more than they should. And for those of you who can get your thumb down on your forearm or your fingers in strange places, that is known as hypermobility. But what does it mean? What actually causes hypermobility? And what causes it is different amounts of elastic fibers in your body. Now, all the ladies will know that there is something called collagen, which is a building block of the body and we have it in our skin and it's what makes our skin stretchy and it's why all the creams have lots of collagen in to make you all nice and stretchy and keep the wrinkles at bay so but collagen is not that simple because collagen comes in lots of different types collagen starts at its very hardest in bone cartilage which is this bit of your nose and your ears your fingernails have got collagen, your hair's got collagen, everything's got collagen in different stretchy amounts. And you can imagine that apart from your skin, your muscles have to be stretchy. And we know in Duchenne very often they're not. But you can also have too much of this elastic collagen in and around your joints, and that makes your joints more bendy than they should be. 
And if you've got very wibbly wobbly ankles or your knees bend backwards or you, know, you can do the splits or get your fingers in funny positions, then the likelihood is you have too much elastic fiber and that causes the bendiness. Now we know that it also is different in different groups. So that Afro-Caribbeans, it is very, very rare to have hypermobility. In the Caucasian population, that's all shades of white, cream, yellow, and other colors similar. It's one in 10 of the population, so quite common. But in the Asian, Indian Asian population, it's one in four. So that all our Duchenne boys, and we have a lot of Duchenne boys from the Indian sort of Asian population from that part of the world are more at risk of having hypermobility normally in the population. And that can add to the difficulties that you have because even if you didn't have Duchenne, we know that people with hypermobility fatigue more easily. So if you're bendy, you will fatigue on top of having Duchenne. You will injure your joints more easily. And you will have to work twice as hard as, as people otherwise do because you need your muscles to be strong to control the extra bendiness of your joints. And that's part of the fatigue. So if you have Duchenne and you have wobbly joints, so you have some muscles that aren't working properly and you have some overstretchy muscles and joints, you have what the Americans would call a double whammy. You have two different things going on, but they add together to make things a little bit more difficult. Now, we know that people who are hypermobile tend not to crawl. They are the bottom shufflers of the world. They tend to have flat feet rather than more caved or tighter feet. They tend to be bendier, so the stretches aren't always necessary, which is a good thing, but they can be extra wobbly around the hips, which is difficult. They can also fall more, they can bruise more easily. And if you're very, very bendy, strange places are also bendy. So you have lots of ligaments around your jaw, so you can find difficulty chewing, you can have difficulty lifting your head up on top of having Duchenne. So being hypermobile and having Duchenne, which nobody ever explains to you, can cause extra problems. So if you are bendy, you may have to do different exercises to protect your joints and you may need to think about this whole fatigue problem which is really quite significant. Now the positive side of being bendy is that you don't have such tight joints and maybe don't need all the stretches, might not even need night splints and I have to tell you the positive is you are the best swimmers in the world. For some reason, bendy people seem to go through the waters more like mermaids or fish or whatever than other people. So you really do make the best swimmers. So those of you who are hypermobile, get in the water and off you go because life is easier in the water for you, definitely. So if mommy and daddy were thinking of the hot tub, good excuse. The fact that you might be bendy does not stop your ankles getting tight, so we need to be careful but you are less likely to get tight. But there are other disadvantages as well. Now, if you are hypermobile and have Duchenne, your physio needs to be aware of the things you can and can't do on top of the norm. And as I say, you don't want to stretch those bendy joints, but you need to be extra careful, particularly on things like trampolines. You may need splints to control your feet. You may need little heel cups in your shoes to control your ankles. And that brings us on to feet. Any questions so far? Should we start with some questions before I get to the feet? Marion, we had a question through from one of the parents. Um, it's, it's a really good, great question. And it's about um, um, mobility, I guess mobility aids. Should I ask that now? Or should, do you want to work through your... When you talk of mobility aids, are we talking wheelchairs and things like that? So, shall I read the question and then you can yes. decide whether you want to take it now uh, or in a bit? Uh, yeah, let's, let's listen okay. to the question and I can work that in. Okay, okay. So, um, 
and actually uh, the, the parent asked if either you or the rest of the parents have any suggestions um, for anything that can help a child get about who isn't in a wheelchair yet. So um, power chairs give um, her son independence, but um, they don't qualify unless your house is ramped. Theirs isn't. Um, they're in Scotland. They don't have a manual chair as yet. So her son is 10 and gets about well, but both heels are not touching the floor now. Um, with restrictions being lifted, he's been to the park a few times, but if they had something that got him there and back, it's not, not sorry, about a three minutes um, walk or stroll, um, it would conserve his energy for when he's at the park. She looked at mobility scooters, but he wasn't keen, they're mainly for adults. Also looked at a quad bike, uh, non-petrol, but they're quite large. Um, they bought the trike two years ago, but they're heavy to pedal with no gears. He can't ride a bike. Um, she said that you can obviously get the scooters with seats, but he may struggle with balance. Um, any suggestions of something that doesn't lack of you know the disability really? It's not you know absolutely a disability aid at that you know if he's there, got a wheelchair are, yet. There are those funny sort of split bike scooters things that have two arms. I don't know what they're called. I'm sure somebody will know. And they're sort of like a scooter with two two legs and you can use those might we be have one marion we Samson's just been out on his actually it's, it's called um they're called striders yeah i can and show you ability. no no I, i'm sure you know what yeah. it is this is yeah. something again we could possibly we could put a, up on the action duchenne website mm -hmm. and show people um the electric scooters are quite wide so you may consider an electric scooter or a motorized trike. Now, a motorized trike, you can get motorized bikes and motorized trikes, and then a lot of people are using them. Um, they are an add on to a normal bike so that they will kick in. At 10 years old, he would be able to use one. They will kick in and give you that extra push on a bicycle that you wouldn't get. Now, no 10 11 year old boy wants to use a trike they look a little bit childish but you can get a motorized bike if his balance is good enough to cycle but he just can't push then a motorized bike now i understand this problem of ramps because we have that all around the uk that they won't give you a wheelchair but you can buy ramps quite quick cheaply portable ramps they are not not madly expensive so that's just an excuse by the local people to avoid the chair because social services could get you temporary ramps or there are companies who will do ramps that are not expensive and so that is something to look into if that's just their excuse but it may be that once it's in the house there isn't much maneuverability for a wheelchair um, the there are some scooters that are a little bit jazzier that sit on scooters there's one called the Go-Go, which doesn't look quite so geriatric. I think one of the troubles for um, younger children is they look like old people's thing. But the Go-Go, the Pride Go-Go, does look a little bit jazzy. There are also mobility trikes that actually fold up into what looks like a suitcase. It seriously looks like a suitcase and it all opens up and it's a mobility trike. So that's quite a jazzy little number and we have several children with those. I have the name of that somewhere which I can get to you because we have that at work but it's really a jazzy little number and as I say it doesn't look so awful um, but I understand that you don't want to look particularly strange or disabled but they aren't I think that there's some of these scooters actually, the three wheel scooters actually look nicer than the wheelchair. So it's just a case of um, investigating. Now, I've possibly mentioned this before. It's based in London, but it's a charity. It's called DLF.org. It's the Disabled Living Foundation. It's a charity. It used to be a government body, obviously. It took away their funding. They were in every major city and you could go in and get advice and see equipment. Government pulled the plug, as they always do. And so there is one remaining DLF in London. It is an amazing resource for any piece of equipment you want information on. 
you just email them and they will send you i this is this is my number one go to when it comes to equipment dlf.org so you contact them they will send you lists of bikes of trikes of electric bikes of scooters of diddy wheelchairs of sports jazzy looking sports wheelchairs of portable lamps you name it they will have information on it do any other parents have anything to add to that because um i know that like, we use the um I can't, it's called, I can't, it's not called a strider, it's called something else. I'll, I'll think of it, I'll ask the guys in a sec. It basically does this and it works really well. Um, and Samson uses a, a, a big balance bike, but he's just about to get too big for his, the biggest balance bike. So he's now, we're going to get a really, really light bike and take off the pedals. So it's propping him up, but he can then kind of do this movement with his feet. But I appreciate that not all the boys have the balance for that. Um, what do you think to that, Marion? I think that I think you've got to go with what works for the individual from a point of view of how they see themselves when they're using it, how it works for the family, how easy it is to pack up and throw in the boot of a car. There are many, many considerations. And I think the only one we really don't like is the bog standard scooter. And the reason we do not like them is because they are so asymmetrical. You only ever stand on one leg and scoot with the other leg. And it really does make for asymmetry. And it's the only one we ask parents to avoid. Anything else, go with it. There is another one called the Petra bike. And I'm looking at the look on your face, Lynette. You've never heard of it. The Petra bike is a European invention. It might even come from Belgium. And it almost looks like a walking frame, but you lean forward on it and you scoot on that. And that's another one. And actually, they do Petra bike racing in Belgium and Holland. And that's another way of the, the boys with Duchenne. And it was developed for Duchenne muscular De dystrophy. It's P E T R A, Petra bike. And that's another thing to consider. There you are, something new you didn't know about. I think I'm looking to Sam, who's been writing all that down. I think we'll pop that on the website. So yeah, that, that'll go up. Um, I think that's it for the questions so far. So go ahead, Marion. Okay, now I want to talk feet. And I want to talk feet because there is a big problem with feet, not that feet, and I'm going to put the light on in a minute because it's getting a bit dark. That's better. Okay, the problem we have with feet, and this goes for your local physio, for your pediatrician, for your orthopedic surgeon, feet are easy to treat. They are easy to splint. They are easy to do things with. So people home in on feet and think oh let's manage the feet and forget that there's a child or a young person attached above the feet so we need to think of the feet not just as two things stuck on the end that flap up and down but as the basis for everything that goes on above and you can't just talk about feet as though there's nothing else above this and this is really important particularly as i know we have some children who surgeons will want to do releases of their ankles and actually it may not be the best thing so we need to think about the mechanics of the feet the bones of the feet it's not quite as simple as just to think of the feet as things that flap up and down they don't and also how then that leads to other problems higher up or how the problems higher up lead to problems with the feet because it's not all about going one way very often what happens in our feet is a combination of things that are going on in the knees the hips and the trunk so apart from the arms everything affects the feet and the feet aff affects everything higher up now i've got some pictures because i think this is important that you understand that the ankle these are the bones of the foot now, I'm not sure what you can see. I know Lynette said she could show this in bigger. How so much? Up, up a bit, Marion, because hopefully everybody can see that you're big, large in the screen. Is that right, Sam? Okay. Yeah? So, yeah. the important bit about this is, this is your heel here. And this is your ankle up 
here. And these bones, you've got your tibia and your fibula, you've got your talus, which sits in the middle, and that is your ankle joint. That's what goes up and down. And I've got another picture to show you. And this is your heel, and your heel is totally separate. That is not part of your ankle joint. That turns in and out. And that is a totally separate joint, and your foot goes up and down, and your heel twists in and out. And then the midfoot rolls sideways. And then all these bones, this one here, this is your fifth met head, your fifth metatarsal. And for all of you into football, this is the one that commonly gets broken in footballers. This fifth metatarsal leading to the little toe. And that's because footballers are not nice creatures and kick each other and that's quite a thin bone to get broken. So that is what the bones of your feet and your ankle look like. Now, if I come to a big picture of what's going on in there, what you have is this big heel joint. Now, this is your ankle joint. I'm just gonna open this because I can see from behind. This is your ankle joint. And all that does is allow your foot to go up and down. And this is your subtalar joint. And that twists your heel in and out. Two separate joints going on at the same time. When you step, you land on your heel. And the important thing is that your heel doesn't roll inwards or roll outwards, but it stays in the middle as your foot goes up and down. And this is where so many of the foot problems occur. Because as you put your heel down, if you put your heel down, Sometimes you've got them rolling in, which is when you're walking on the middle bit of your feet. And sometimes that heel rolls out and you're twisting onto the outside borders of your feet. So when you're walking, if you keep your heels down, we want the heel to land right in the middle and the foot to go down straight to stop this rolling in and out. But that doesn't always happen. And then what happens if you see the picture below you will see that your heel can twist in and out and cause problems around the ankle joint because it stretches the tendons, it stretches the ligaments, and it makes your foot a less stable surface. It can make it more painful and it can make walking more work. And this is why some of you will be asked to wear heel cups to keep that heel in the middle when you put your heel down to stop it rolling in or rolling out because that actually is harder than just walking on your toes and we know walking on our toes is not difficult and if you don't know that ask any lady who wears high heels because walking on your toes is not such a big deal but walking on the inside or the outside of your feet is a problem so that's what that's about. That is really important. When, and I'm going to just get to Ike, my mate Ike here. So you've seen, probably seen Ike before. Um, so Mary, as it's, the, as it's the last of our six, are you able to tell us why he's called Ike? Yeah, because he comes from Ikea. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, it's as basic as that. I don't know if, if the name Ike conjures up different connotations, but I just... It does, it. to me. <laughs> oh, right. No, no, no. It's only because he comes from Ikea. I had no other thought about... There we go. Thought. Okay, so Thank when you. stepping, that's up and down and in and out. And when you're stepping... You, the idea is you put your heel down and you roll in a straight line and come up again. But when you walk on your toes, there is a reason for doing that. Now, it's important for parents to understand. It's important for physios to understand. It's even more important for orthopedic surgeons to understand 
that it is important for a lot of boys with Duchenne to walk on their toes. They don't do it because they're not allowed to have high heels. They don't do it because they want to be taller. They don't do it because they don't like their heels, they only want to walk on their toes. This is why boys with muscular dystrophy walk on their toes. So if you walk on your toes, young men out there, this is why you're doing it. Your bottom is weak. This should be a big fat muscle and it's not. Ladies have big fat muscles there, but men don't. Anyway, the muscle that straightens your knee, your kicking muscle, is not as strong as the muscle that pulls your foot back. So the muscle that kicks forward is not as strong as your hamstring, which kicks back. Now, normally, the one that kicks forward should be stronger than the one that kicks back. But in Duchenne, the one that kicks forward is weaker. And then lastly, the muscle at the back of the calf that points the foot down, a bit like a ballerina, I'm afraid, is stronger than the muscles at the front that pull the foot up. So this is weak, your bottom is weak, and your bottom muscles keep you upright. If your bottom muscles are weak, you tend to bend forward, and then you end up with this big arch in your back to keep you up. And that's not very comfortable. So some of you boys will know that you stand with this big arch in your back and it's not comfortable, but you can't stand any other way because if you try and pull your tummy in and stand straighter, you collapse at the knees. So what happens is you've got this quite arched position and when you are tired, you go on your toes because the muscles in the back of your legs, your hamstrings, are the ones that are working to help keep you upright. And that is where we end up. And the most effective way of walking when you're tired or when your walking gets harder and harder is on your toes. Okay, so there is nothing wrong with boys walking on their toes. They need to do it. No physio should be splinting feet, no orthopedic surgeon should be chopping feet, and no parent should be telling their children off because they're walking on their toes. They need to do it. The problem then becomes if you get tight in your ankles. Now, many boys walk on their toes but still don't have tight ankles, and how do we know? Because when you stand still, what are you doing? Are you on your toes or can you get your heels down? And that is the most important. Not what you're doing when you're walking, but what are you doing when you're standing still? And when you are standing still, ideally you will get your heels down and still be able to raise your toes a little bit off the floor when you're standing still. Not easy. A lot of people can't balance on their heels, but even just to be able to lift your toes up a little bit with your heels on the floor. Why? Why is that important? Because the ability to lift your foot helps you get upstairs, helps you get up from a chair, helps you get up from the floor, helps you go up a slope, helps you go up a curb. All these things, the more movement you have in your ankles, the easier it will be. If you are stuck on your toes, all those things get more difficult. And that's why we want you to keep stretches, active stretches, with you boys doing the work, active stretches, and those dreaded night splints. Now, if you don't like dreaded night splints, you can have even more dreaded CCDs. And these, crocodile type things, which some of you wear, which I have nearly lost a finger on, are supposed to stretch you during the day and save you from wearing these. Now I know Newcastle are doing a study on this and until the results are out, I will stick to these. 
because most of the boys I know who have these either just pull their heel out of the bottom or say they're not comfortable or are asked to sit for two hours wearing them and I do not agree with any child sitting still for two hours because that's not a normal thing for any child to do. And most boys who sit for two hours doing anything, which is usually Xbox or television or something else, will not sit straight. They will sit slumped or to one side. So we don't like you sitting still for two hours. But what we have found with these things, which as I say, are a little bit vicious, is that actually you will get a better stretch walking around. So it's something to think about. Now, the dreaded night splints. Why do we ask boys to wear the dreaded night splints? People will say it's to give you a stretch at night in bed. It is never, ever, ever to give you a stretch. Because if you are stretching your feet at night in bed, that's going to be uncomfortable and you're not going to sleep. And more important than you not sleeping, it means mummy and or daddy are not sleeping either because they're up in the night because you're complaining. Or they're up in the night taking your splints off. Or they're up in the night because they've heard that bang bang against the wall as you've thrown them across the room. But these splints should not be uncomfortable. Some of the boys do find they give them cramp from keeping their feet still all night instead of wiggling them, but you should be able to wiggle your toes in them. They should never be so tight in the straps that you can't have a wiggle. They should never come over your knees so that you're never going to be in a stretch position because as soon as your knees are bent, you're not stretched anyway. You will see that this has got no lining except for where there's bony lumpy bits inside for lots and lots of reasons but the main reason they are not lined is firstly they are cooler and secondly it stops all the lining getting sweaty and monkey and smelly and disgusting so we do not line our night splints a toe strap is not always necessary only if your foot's tending to wiggle to one side it doesn't have to be clown size some orthotic companies will give you them long enough for three clowns to get in them because they think they'll last longer, but that doesn't always work. The strap across here needs to be soft on the inside. So something soft, even a synthetic sheepskin, but that nasty neoprene stuff is not that nice and sweaty all night in bed. If the heel is too deep, then this strap will not hold your foot in. So they can't be too deep because your foot will wiggle around. And this strap should also be a nice material if it's against your skin. Or you can wear socks or cotton stockinette or something inside to stop them being sweaty. Now, and I'm sure I've shown you this before, but I'm sure I'm going to show you again. There's a little hole in the bottom here, right in the bottom. And that hole is not to let the sweat drip out. That hole is so that you can see if your heel is right down. I love these actually, they're quite jazzy, the skull and crossbones. Now there's three holes at the back, a few holes at the back there, supposedly to make them cooler along the back of your calf, stop you sticking completely to them, but I think you, do, you still stick a little bit. So it is worth having some something, a sock, a cotton sock or a piece of cotton stocking net inside to stop them sticking to your legs. The other thing you might find is where there are rivets inside, they should be covered because when you get sweaty, those rivets can get rusty and then you end up with rust marks on your legs. So please make sure all your inside rivets are covered if your splints aren't lined. They should always be comfortable and ideally they should be set at 90 degrees. And if you can wear them all night good, if you can't because they stop you turning over, then one one night and one the next night. If they give you cramp, then you might be able to wear them in the evenings. But ideally, sometime during the day, sometime during the night if possible, because it's holding your foot in a nice position in bed instead of letting it hang down for up to 12 hours a night. 
So ideally, we should be wearing night splints from very early on. And the earlier we start them, the quicker we get used to them. Now, if you are somebody who likes to wander in the night to go for a wee or to climb into mummy and daddy's bed, you need to make sure the orthotic company put a non-slip bottom on them because they should not be walked in. Boys with DMD should not be walking in their splints. This is not a good idea because apart from these, which will actually flex a little bit because you will constantly be pushing against the splint and trying to get your heel out and you will end up rubbing around your ankle. So actually we don't advocate walking splints ever for boys with DMD. Oswestry did a study about four years ago looking at day splints, walking splints in DMD, and the study showed that they only work for a few weeks, and then as soon as the angle of the foot or the heel changes, the splints aren't useful. So actually, we never ever advocate foot splints for walking in DMD, not AFOs. We do use ankle splints for boys whose feet roll in or roll out. We use mostly Trilock splints. Those are the softer splints with three straps. Some of the children wear something called Smaffos, which is a short splint that only comes around the ankles, but they can be quite hard plastic and not everybody gets on with them. Or, as I mentioned, you can have heel cups or long heel cups to control your heel, and they can be important. But those are the splints we use, and ideally, if possible, we would like the boys to wear them, the night splints, for at least two or three hours a night if they can't manage all night. Have we got any questions there? Not so far. Okay. So where do we go from splints? One of the things that I want to talk about, because I know this is a situation that's arisen, and that is when we get to the point where we are walking on our toes the whole time, where do we go from there? Do we have surgery? Is that a good idea? My feeling is if boys are walking on their toes the whole time, if walking is becoming more difficult, then first and foremost, but not done willy-nilly, then we would try serial casting. And I think we've talked about serial casting before. Serial casting cannot be done by anybody any orthopedic surgeon will stick you in plaster for five weeks, which is far too long. You will lose an enormous amount of muscle bulk, uh, which you may not regain. We serially cast three plasters in 12 days. And if you're not going to get the range of movement back, then you won't get it back in three plasters in a short time. It's a very effective temporary measure to make walking easier. So ideally we would always try serial casting before we tried any surgery. Surgery is not a good idea generally because unless you are very strong, very strong in the right muscle groups and it's only your ankles that are tight, then having surgery to your ankles can completely knock you off your feet. Because it is like a house of cards. If you take away the bottom, the rest will come crashing down. The mechanics of ankles cannot be separated from what is happening at the knees and what is happening at the hips. This is all related. And as the boys go higher onto their toes and are more on the toes, this is not because the feet are tighter at first. It is because the hips are getting weaker and the boys are getting taller. So it's very much a case of what is going on at the hips affects what is happening at the feet and not the other way around. 
as the boys get weaker and they get more arched and the muscles at the front get weaker, they rely more and more on their hamstring and their calf muscle to keep them up and keep them mobile. So if you release the calf muscle, it destabilizes the knee, which then destabilizes the hip and causes a lot of problems with walking. Surgery to the ankle should never ever be undertaken unless everybody knows what they are doing. That the physio is in place for after surgery and you have quite intensive physio. You need to walk in the plasters and you need splints after the plasters come off. And this is the only time we say splints for walking because your brain still thinks up on my toes. And we need to splint the feet with short day splints, not night splints, different splints for daytime, after surgery, to help you get back into a good walking pattern. But it's important that everybody knows what they're doing before you consider surgery to the ankles, that somebody has checked the hips are strong enough, and the knees are strong enough, otherwise doing surgery to the ankles can completely stop the boys from standing, let alone walking. And that sounds very negative, but it's really important that people know what they're doing when they're doing this surgery. And we know that mistakes can happen, and we know you are better off walking on your toes and walking effectively on your toes than trying to release them and really struggling. So it's really important that everybody knows what they're doing and the orthopedic surgeons have treated boys with Duchenne before and know what they are doing and know what they're trying to achieve and that it's done generally in younger boys, not older boys. Now it may well be that some of the boys are finding it so difficult to walk that without the surgery they won't manage but they will need cathos or splints after the surgery. Again, it's not as simple as to say, let's just chop those ankles and everything will be fine. It's not that simple. This is not cerebral palsy. This is not other things. This has to be done with an understanding of the mechanics of Duchenne. And that is really important. Generally, the doctors at a neuromuscular service will understand the mechanics better than a general hospital orthopedic surgeon. But not all of the neuromuscular centers do do this regularly. And so they need to be aware that it's not just simple. You really must have the right physio in place for after surgery. And that's important. And this is not to scare anyone, but this is to make sure that if it's done, it's done right. And it's done with the best results. It can be done, but you need to make sure all the right things are in place first. Any questions? Uh, not uh, well. We, we have a question. I don't, I don't know if it's really um, the right question for today. It's about a clinical trial that's going on at Gosh. Am I best to refer that to um, Neil? Do you think, Marion? I don't know. I am not involved in clinical trials at Gosh. That's what I suspected. So um, I, I will I, I will liaise directly with the parent that asked the question, and I'll get them to talk to Neil about that. As yeah. Thank yeah. you. Okay, so then we need to talk about stretches. One of the things about stretches is that the boys don't like them, the parents don't like them, physios don't like them. Nobody likes stretches. Nobody wants to do stretches. But they do help. They can be effective. They don't have to be boring. They should never be painful. And just because you are not walking does not mean you should stop. Because you will stiffen up. You might not get more contracted, 
but you will get stiffer if you don't. And some of the young adults and even older adults get very, very stiff just from never being moved. And that can get uncomfortable. And what tends to happen is you tend to get postures that generally you are stuck during the day, that you're sitting hunched or you're sitting to one side, you're sitting in a difficult position, but you find it very hard to get comfortable. In bed at night, it gets difficult. You find it hard to get comfortable at night. You end up with sleeping systems or mattresses, special mattresses, special uh, support systems. But generally, it is still important to keep your joints mobile. And you know, you think about it, all adults, the yoga, the Pilates, the stretches, actually a lot of adults are stretching all the time without even knowing it. If you do Pilates or yoga, if you're one of these people who runs and does their stretches after they've done their exercise, you know, little things will stretch you. Reaching up for a cupboard will stretch your back and your shoulders. Reaching down into the cupboard under the stairs to get the hoover out. Hoovering when you can't be bothered to pull the hoover along behind you so you just stretch under the furniture. We are stretching all the time. We are stretching to get a book. We are stretching to catch something that's dropped. So in the normal course of a day, we do stretch naturally to keep ourselves mobile. And those of you who sit at computers all day will know how stiff you get if you do not get up and move around every so often. So if you get engrossed in the television, in something on the computer, and then you suddenly stand up, everything seems to have seized up and you have a stretch. What happens when you stand up? You have a stretch. You stretch your arms. You stretch when you yawn. We stretch regularly. Don't forget that. These are things people don't even think about. You think, oh, stretches are boring, stretches are this, stretch. But actually, in the normal course of movement, we all stretch. We stretch our ankles when we are getting up from the floor. We stretch our ankles when we are going upstairs. We don't even think about the fact we're doing it. So we say, oh, stretches are boring, stretches are difficult, stretches don't help, stretches but yet we are all doing stretches all the time with our movement. As I say, you stretch up into a cupboard, you stretch down to the floor to pick something up. So that if you were to write down, there's a nice little lockdown activity. See how many times in the day you actually stretch something. Stretch to reach, stretch to go to the side, stretch to scratch the cat or get the cat bowl off the floor, stretch the dog because, or you're being stretched by the dog on the lead. All these things you are doing without even thinking that you are stretching your joints. So when we think, oh, it's boring, oh, can't be bothered, oh, I don't want to do it. Actually, if the boys aren't stretching, again, we are missing something that in the normal course of events happens all the time during the day. We are constantly stretching. Now, stretching our joints keeps them healthy, keeps the ligaments moving, keeps the tendons stretched, but also keeps the joints supple. It keeps the cartilage, and I know Marina mentioned this, that actually by moving your joints, you are oiling your joints. It's a bit like pistons. As they go up and down, it pumps the oil into the joints. Weight bearing helps your joints mobilize, helps keep them lubricated. Movement helps, otherwise you stiffen up. So we need to think that this stretching is not more than normal. This is doing for the boys what they find difficult to do for themselves because of the muscle imbalance and the muscle weakness. The fact that we are asking them to actively get involved allows them to be part of it, allows them to work those joints, allows them to work the muscles and be part of those stretches as they would be in the normal situation. So again, like I have said in the past, if you do something for the boys that they can do themselves, you are taking away an opportunity to exercise in the same way 
if you think that stretches aren't useful or boring or whatever, we are taking away an opportunity to move these joints as they would normally in the course of a day. This is not an extra. This is putting back what should be there. So don't just think about stretches as an extra. This would be part of everyday life. Any questions? I seem to have hit a nerve on that one. Yeah, not, not so far. If anyone does have questions, please put them in the chat or just raise your hand and we can take you off mute. Okay, we need to look at mobility and we need to think about changes in mobility. Hello, Kat. We need to think about changes in mobility. We need to think about conserving energy. We need to think about good wheelchairs and bad wheelchairs. We need to think about the boys, and this is important. We need to think about the boys who have difficulty in modifying their behavior, whereby you may not want them to have a wheelchair that they can push themselves. There are some boys whose behavior would suggest that an electric wheelchair might be dangerous. There are certainly parents and carrier mums, manifesting carrier mums, who find manual wheelchairs difficult to push. And what we have to think of, and again, I, I get a big problem with this, it's not one size fits all. We cannot make recommendations across the board. There is no one thing that works for every family, every boy, every mum, every situation. So everybody is individual, every family has different situation, every situation needs individual management. It is not a case of you are this age, you are doing this, you need this wheelchair, you do this, you do this. Everybody has to be considered differently. Every mum has to be considered in what she can cope with, particularly, as I say, manifesting carriers. If you are a carrier who is struggling, you need to make that known to your physio. It's no good the physio asking you to do stretches and this and that, pushing wheelchairs, if you find it difficult. And I think there are physios and there are social services out there who do not understand the difficulties of carrier mums who have their own problems. And we need to make sure that we help you too. I am not going to ask you to do a ton of stretches if you find them difficult. But similarly, you should not be carrying and lifting your child if you yourself are struggling with power. And again, social services need to be aware of this. You shouldn't be lifting the boys upstairs. You shouldn't be trying to pick them up off the floor. All these things need to be taken into consideration when we're thinking about mobility. Really, really important. So as I say, the big issue is, as many boys as I know, and I think we see around 300 a year at Great Ormond Street, Every single one has a different situation, a different family, different things going on, different amount of hypermobility, different age, different stage, different siblings. No two families are the same. And no two families should be treated the same. And one of the things we do not do is give out bog standard exercises, bog standard programs to everybody and say, OK, do this page, but not this page. We like to think we treat our children as individuals, our families as individuals, and we think about the difficulties of each family separately, and each one needs to have something that works for them. But if it doesn't work for you, you've got to let us know, or you've got to let your physio know. The worst thing we can do is let you go from your physio assessment or your physio session, and you walk out the door and think, that didn't work for me. That I didn't understand that, that didn't help. I can't do that. That's not ever gonna get done. We need to sit down in the physio review at your neuromuscular service, or you need to speak to the physio 
one of the problems we have for parents is you may, your child may have physio at school and you may never see the physio these days. Your physio may come to school once a term. It may be the classroom assistant who's doing the exercises. There are many parents who will say, oh, well, they go into school. They know the name, but they wouldn't be able to pick them up in a, out in a lineup. Which one's your physio? Oh, I don't know. I only ever speak to her on the phone or I only ever get a message in, in that school handover book. So there are times when you've never even met your physio. Oh, my physio's on maternity leave. How many times have I heard, oh, I don't know who my physio is, they're on maternity leave. We need to make sure that whatever they're asking you to do at home works for you. And this is so important. When you go to clinic for a review, and this is particularly true of neuromuscular clinics, they will do all these wonderful assessments. So you'll do an all star and you do a time to rise from the floor and you'll run down the corridor and somebody will time it. And they'll give you all these numbers to take away with you, but actually you leave there thinking, well, I've got a load of numbers, but what else have I got? Have I got the right advice for me and my family? Has somebody looked at my wheelchair? Has somebody helped me look at the way I'm carrying my child or lifting them in and out of the bath or in and out of the car. Now I know some units have OTs, but some don't. We do not have an OT. So all the handling, all the lifting, all is something that we will take care of. We will shout and scream about in our unit, but in some units you'll see an OT. But try and be brave parents, try and speak up, try and say, this is what I need to walk away with from this review not just a number on the north star scale not just a this was two seconds slower getting up from the floor you need to walk away with something useful so please make sure that your clinic reviews work for you your child and your family because that's what it's about otherwise there's no point in going for the reviews if it's just to come out with a pile of numbers you can work out yourself that your young man can no longer get up from the floor or your young man finds it harder to hop or can't hop or struggles more with the stairs. You do not need to go all the way to your nearest neuromuscular service to be told, oh, Fred can no longer get up from the floor. You could have told the physio that. So we need to make sure that when you have clinical reviews, and I'm not using the word assessment on purpose because assessment is only part of the clinical review, the numbers that you come out with are part of the clinical review. They're not the answer to all the things you need to help you manage your child's stretches, exercises, and mobility. So we need to be brave and we need to leave the room with armed with what we think we need. If you don't want them, that's fine. If you don't want to hear, that's fine. You don't want to do them. You are perfectly entitled not to do them. But if you do want the help, you have to make sure you get it. Okay, still no questions? No, I think everyone's just taking it all in. I know I certainly am. I can see Sam um, is busily, furiously writing away there. Um, Nisha, have you got any questions this week? So I always pick on you, Nisha, just because you're, yeah? Oh, she has, here we go. I'm just gonna ask you to unmute it, Nisha. Oh, no, I don't have any questions. I'm taking it all in. Okay. A lot of what Marion's talked about is, is the stuff that I'm doing or I'm thinking about doing. So I'm sort of ahead of the game a little bit. So, um, no, I'm just taking it all in. So I don't right. have a at the I think what, what's quite interesting, Marion, is I don't know if you feel the same. Obviously, Nisha is one of the people that's been here every week for the last six weeks. Um, and, I, you know, obviously Sam and I have as well. I think because we're not experts and because we have our whole world is packed full of information we've had to learn so quickly in our Duchenne journeys, I, I could hear it six times in a row and I still hear something new and different every time. Are you the same, Sam? Every single time I pick up something different. That's because we're not experts and when we're listening to you, like we're, we're trying to take it in, but then 
something will, the penny will drop and it and you learn that something and there's a new takeaway every time I think what's interesting what you say is in this Duchenne journey, because it's a different life. It's a different set of things you have to learn. When you have a child, it's, it's something alien. You know, you see this scrawny little thing that poos and wheezes and doesn't have much control over everything. And actually as a new mum, you just look at it and think, oh my God, now what? And that is a journey in itself. But then when you have to add difficulties on top, it becomes a hundred times more complex. You, we used to say to parents, here's your diagnosis, here's your brick wall, go bang your head. And that was true and can still be true in certain situations with wheelchair services, with social services, ramps adaptations all these things that parents just get sick of battling or give up but generally as you say there's so much information to take in over and above just looking after a child getting them up in the morning getting them to school i show a slide which which some of you would have seen at action duchenne conference of all the people that come into your life who would never come into your life if your child didn't have some difficulties so you've got all the therapists you've got loads of different doctors this is not just about a neuromuscular doctor you've got a cardiologist an endocrinologist an orthopedic surgeon a spinal surgeon you may have a gastroenterologist you may have um, other doctors involved if they have other things on top because having duchenne does not necessarily stop them having other problems. You know, you could have renal problems, you could have autism, you could have other things going on on top of the Duchenne. So you've got all your doctors, you've got all your therapists, you may have a dietitian, a speech therapist, an occupational th therapist, two physiotherapists, because one at the neuromuscular service and one local, three occupational therapists, because you'll have social services OT, you'll have your neuromuscular OT, and you'll have your NHS OT, like your NHS physio. So you've got three OTs, only two physios, three OTs, and then you start on all the other things, school, wheelchair services, special needs teachers, all the things that you have on top. Of housing, it. housing people, doing housing, housing adaptations. But it's very often... OT, social services, social workers, mobility, and then you get the school people. And then if you're having clinical trials, that's a whole, a whole bunch of people on top. Again, getting onto clinical trials is stressful, not getting onto clinical trials is stressful. So there are many, many strands of life that are added. And as you say, everybody has their own jargon. Orthotists speak, AFOs, CAFOs, SMAFOs, try, you know, splints have a whole language of their own. So you do have to learn an amazing amount. You have to learn who you have to fight with and who you have not to fight with. You need to pick your battles, not only with all these professionals around you, but with your kids as well. And this is something we have to think about. It's those battles with your children that you have to think about as well in terms of do you battle about bedtime? Do you battle about splints? How many battles can you actually have? And one of the things we have talked about with children and battles is many parents battle with their children. Battle over splints, battle over stretches, battle over exercise and while you pick your battles it's very hard to actually instill in the boys and there are boys who cannot get this concept at all but the for the boys who can understand they have to learn that winning the battle doesn't win them anything it only wins the battle but in the long term, you can lose the war. Because by battling and battling and refusing to wear your night splints for no good reason other than you want to battle, 
ultimately, what have you won? You have won tighter ankles. If you refuse to do your stretches and it becomes a battle and you give up, what have they won? They have won the right to tighter joints or weaker muscles. So what we try and instill in the boys that ultimately is still their body and they can still battle, but when you make the choice, and this is particularly true for teenagers, you have the right to choose. But then if with choice, you have to accept the consequences of your choices. If you decide you're not going to wear your night splints, fine. But don't come back in a year's time and say, look at my feet. They're tight. They're twisted. They're hurting. We need to make the boys, those who can, understand that by making choices may not actually get them where they want to be. Now, one of the things about non-ambulant boys that we find is much more popular than night splints is wearing their splints during the day. Look, if you have good splints, and there is a difference with day splints, in night splints, you tend to have this long foot that comes well past the toes. In day splints, they should stop in the middle of the foot to allow you to have a decent sized shoe. It's very rare that you need to come past the toes to fit a toe strap because if the foot is a little bit twisting at that stage, the shoe should hold it. So you shouldn't need to get clown shoes for day splints. So very often when the boys lose ambulation, we will say to them, would you prefer to wear day splints under your shoes? Nobody will see them at school. You possibly won't even have to take them off for PE. Would you rather do that than wear battle with night splints? And we often change from night splints to day splints when the boys aren't walking. So there are compromises the whole way. It's not about making life tougher or more difficult or harder. It's just trying to make the best of what we have at any point in time. Physio does not stop progression of the disease. But the attempt is to slow it down. We can't cure. We're trying to slow things down slow down the tightness slow down the deterioration in the good muscles slow down the postural asymmetry and slow down some of the difficulties that go with those it doesn't work for everyone we are not here to criticize we are here to support we accept there are families who cannot and do not do but that does not stop us trying to give you the best possible advice for you and your child. You do not have to take it. It's the same as getting the medicine and leaving it in the cupboard. It's up to you whether you take it. There is nothing to say you must have the physio. Most families, it's very, very rare when the children come to clinic that the, the parents will say, we don't want physio. We do know, um, again, possibly because we see so many boys, that for some boys it is too stressful to have physio in a neuromuscular service. They don't know us that well, they don't meet us that often, and they have particular needs whereby coming to physio, trying to do a formal assessment, is really outside the scope of their behavior and their coping mechanisms. And if it's going to cause so much distress, it's easier to leave it to the local teams who know them better. And we're not going to force a physio assessment on any child who can't cope with it. So again, it shouldn't be a case of stress for parents. If parents want to talk to physio, and we do have situations where the parents will come and literally the boys will wander around the room and do their own thing, that is fine. If that's what works for that boy and that family, there are many boys we cannot ask to do a formal assessment. We cannot even measure their joints. And if that's the situation, nobody should force you into feeling that you have failed 
or that this is all a waste of time. We can still work with those children and families, even if the boys can't cooperate with full assessment. We can still have a clinical review. We can still try and help when there are situations that are physio related. So parents should never ever feel that they failed in terms of physio. They should never feel that because a child hasn't cooperated with the formal parts of the assessment that it was somehow a waste of time. As I say, it's not about leaving the room with a pile of numbers. It's about leaving the room with the advice and management that works for you and your family. And that's what physio should be about. And Marion, I'd, I'd like to ask for some people that, that um, weren't here for that particular session. You did a wonderful session on uh, making sketches fun, which has just gone through the roof on YouTube for us. Um, we have had the, obviously got the recording of that and it is on our website. So what I'll do is I'll make sure I send that um through to everybody when i do the feedback form tomorrow because that there were some amazing ideas to to get pe get the, the kids to do stretches without even knowing it um and certainly stretches that you know i'd never been shown by my community physio and ones that i use now on sam which he loves actually it shouldn't be horrible it shouldn't be horrible. It shouldn't be a chore. That's the worst of it. When it just becomes a chore and becomes negative. It is something that if you can get it fun, if you can all enjoy it and it's for life, you know, it's, it helps. It definitely helps. Well, let's make it positive. There's no reason it should hurt. There's no reason it should be boring. It's not about making life difficult. That's really not what physio should be about. We need, we need the boys to join in. That's what it's about. We need them to say, that's what I want to do. Does anybody want to ask a question to Marion? Oh, I'll unmute you there. I've just asked to unmute you. Are you hearing um, me? There we go, yes. Uh, hello for everyone. Sorry, I miss uh, the, the beginning of your interview. I, uh, I remember, Maria, when you were talking in one conference that uh, those boys who were using splints uh, when they were ambulant, they will have nice legs. Uh, not everyone did this. But are you, in the beginning of your talk, uh, said about uh, non-ambulant boys? Also, they had different splints for night and for day? The night splints do have a longer foot. Okay. The day splints have a shorter foot to make it easier to put a shoe over the top. Okay, so it means that if a boy have a contraction on his knees and ankle, if uh, it recommendation to use night splints also. The, the, if they're very contracted, then the night splints may not help. And if the foot is twisted if the foot twists you may yes. find splints are very uncomfortable mm -hmm. so yes. there, but what we find is day splints because the knees are always bent during the day sometimes the splints are oh my goodness that's a cafo that's not a that's that's a cafo <laughs> is that a night splint no it's for daily use it's for stretching it's for 45 minutes uh, three times per day and it, they did them in Belgium, but I saw something in Italy in conference and I asked how you can do for us something like this. But for uncle, for one uncle, which is um, now going uh, um, in this position. Twist. It, yeah. Yes, it's, it's, I think that it's not useful, but it's uh, doing something more bad thing. That's very often when we will do the serial casting. We will mm -hmm. use plaster to bring the foot into a better position. Mm -hmm. Very often we actually use the tape under the plaster to hold the foot in a nice position. We plaster only three short plasters. This plaster stays on, but we can bring the foot into a better position and then use the splints to hold that position. 
But if the foot is very twisted, then splints will be more uncomfortable. And we have to think, what are we gaining by using a splint that is not comfortable? Mm -hmm. And if the foot is very twisted, if the boy's cardiac function is okay, should we be thinking about surgery for the feet? Yes, and, and, and if uh, uh, my son is five, uh, 15 years old and he talking himself, maybe maybe we can do surgery for this leg because one leg was, uh, we had surgery when he was working and now for him it's comfortable to be comfortable to be with shoes, yes. And one leg is going inside and, and we have stretching and exercises five days per week, but it's not helping. And no. Explain mm -hmm. But if you are considering surgery, you must consider it sooner because you need good cardiac function. Do not wait for a long time because it may become that it's not suitable for him. So if you're thinking of surgery, don't wait for too long. Don't wait. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I am not taking uh, two time from you now. What's I, uh, Lynette, I am not. Uh, uh, I am not uh, taking two time. <laughs> too long. Time. No. 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 Ah. Not, not, no, not at all. No, no. These are very valid questions. You carry okay. on. Absolutely. Carry on. I have here is one leg, <laughs> and here is after oh. surgery. And yeah. this one, it's, are you see? You see? No, that's too tight. That's much too tight. That is tight in the middle. That is tight yes. in the back and tight in the middle. The middle of the foot is tight. And that, yes. you cannot stretch that without causing Yes, pain. yes. The, the, the stretches will cause pain. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that we would suggest surgery for that foot as long as his heart is good. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. I am no so problem. happy. And every time we are, uh, thank you for everything what you are telling. Every time we are uh, trying to do the best, <laughs> but we touching with bad things. And well, every, every time I am feeling guilty, maybe I am not doing Never ever feel guilty. That is not the idea. You should never feel guilty. You do what works for you and for him. That's enough. There's nothing to feel guilty about. It's not about guilt. Okay. It's about what, what's right for you. Thank you for everyone. I am so happy to be here with you. And remember also that everything you will do as a Duchenne mum will have <laughs> his interest in your heart and will be coming from a place of love so you there's haven't no got to feel guilt. guilty because there's everything no you're guilt. doing is right there's no guilty thank you my dear we are all experimental parents we don't know if we had 20 kids we might get it right by number 20 but i'm sure number 20 would say we've got it wrong no child will ever tell you you got it all right and you think about your own parents, they didn't get it all right. We can't, there's no manual, there's no books, there's nothing that tells you how to get it right. We do and, the best we can. Okay, and in practice, after surgery, after such a, a situation, it's possible to keep a, a, a leg in better position or we will touch in future again with some problems? That will depend on whether they do soft tissue surgery, just the muscles and the tendons, or whether they actually fix the bones. If they fix the bones, it should never change. If yes. they do soft tissue surgery just the muscles and the tendons it can turn again so at 15 they might be better doing actually to fix the bones okay okay thank you so much i received too much information okay brilliant thanks for asking the questions lovely to see you um does anybody else have any questions so have you got any questions because you never get you never get to ask your questions on these sessions <laughs> Uh, no, I haven't at the moment. I've, as always, Marion, I've written so many notes. Thank you so much. But it's all recorded, so you shouldn't need to write so Oh, I like my notes. I love my notes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to do it pictorially. Amazing. <laughs> well, you I think... You can't if... to draw stick men. <laughs> yes. 
if there's no other questions, I think we're there. I'm just checking back to everybody. Yeah. The only, only other thing that we need, if we're going to go to monthly, Lynette, we want the parents to give us topics. Yes, one that's the, true. One of the things we haven't really touched on is wheelchairs and seating. Now that would be very interesting. That would be. Perhaps we could kick that, that off as our first one, Marion. That, that may be something that we need to think about is wheelchairs mm. and seating. I must admit, in my naivety, I didn't even fathom that you would be able to give us that information, but of course you can. So let's do well, it. We have no OTs in our team, so we have to do all that. So let's do that then. Okay, yeah. no problem. When we have a date, that's what we will do. And I'll get back to you with a date. It's on my list. No <laughs> the ever-growing list. <laughs> I know. It never gets shorter. Oh. Okay. Thank, take thank you so much. As always, we appreciate everything no, you're doing for us, Marion. Absolutely Marianne. my pleasure. Absolutely my pleasure. Take care. Thank you. Take thank care, you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. You're staying on, Sam. Bye, Nisha. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Lema. See you. Nice to meet you, Lema. I think we've seen you at the conference, haven't we, before, for definite? Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah. Lovely to see you. It was nice. It was nice. Thank you so much. Oh, Julie, thank you. No worries, Doris, Julie, and Tracy. Thanks, Tracy, for joining us. Hope to see you on next week. So, um, so Brian. So, next week you will have so, uh, something more? Oh, no, sorry. I was saying to Tracy, um, she's, I think ah, she's just okay. gone. Okay, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, we have... Um, so next week we've got um, Brian Perdue, who is a 42-year-old uh, man um, living with Duchenne. He's talking about his life. We've also got how to find um, a job and um, maintain um, employment when you have Duchenne. We've also got a um, another session, obviously, with Marion. We're going to do it every month now from now on. Uh, but all Wonderful. of the sessions that we've recorded with her are all on the website, which is in that link. So do have a look. It's a huge amount of um, information. Uh, but we've also got the learning and behaviour with Duchenne. We've got the adult um, stretches, assisted stretches as well that we had with Matt, with Marina DeMarco. Um, what else did we have? Oh, we had how to make the most of your online appointments with Dr. Spinty from Older Hay. So yeah, we've got loads of stuff on the website. Um, to take a look. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm so going bye to bye.